Hi everyone, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you all. Uh, I like to do this thing when people join where I, uh, if you go in the chat, you can let us know where in the world you are, maybe. Uh, and if you have a dog, maybe a little bit about them, like their breed or their name, um, I can get us started. I am in London. And I am in Brooklyn, New York, in the United yeah. States. Donville, New York. London too. Woo, hello. And I have a poodle and a staffy and a mutt. Gosh, I have more dogs than I realized. <laughs> I've accrued them suddenly. And I'm like, gosh, that's quite a long list now. <laughs> my dogs, if anyone wants to share. Actually, Dr. Rendon, tell me about your dogs. I don't even know them, your dogs very well. Well, so I have little Jojo, little Jolene, who um, is a rescue. She's about three years old now. And um, she's from Texas. Uh, we don't know her background, but she's pr pretty much more a cat than a dog. So very simple. <laughs> she's, she's actually, she's lovely, lovely, lovely. And then my daughter has a dog, Atlas, who's a pity mix, also a rescue, um, very rambunctious, a lot of energy, but just, I adore him. He's he's both good and bad all the time. <laughs> oh, I love those dogs, naughty but I nice. Do I do too, so awesome. So good, oh my gosh, we've got standard poodle from montreal three month old standard poodle oh my goodness that is the cutest poodle puppies oh poodle puppies are so cute um and female sheldy so it's such good dogs got high energy dogs working dogs four month old pug love it i love pug. that look pug oh my god I love <laughs> dr rendon's massive pug above her head <laughs> welcome everyone <clears throat> all right so coming up to Hi, five sally sally phillips she goes to how are you <laughs> oh my god look at the pug look at the yeah, pug. Wow, oh my perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we're holding up over here it's oh. kitchen is it oh here yes. show us dogs it's if you have kitchen. dogs He's perfect. i love pugs oh my <laughs> god italian but living in switzerland oh this is why i love online stuff it's so cool yeah. you get the coolest group of people involved well it's five past so we can probably uh get underway i guess before we get started just shopkeeping things um we're recording this obviously and we'll send it all out to everybody afterwards as well as the slideshow so there are some like videos embedded and links and stuff you'll get access to all of those we'll send that email out tomorrow um but other than that that was the kind of own, only like shopkeeping thing right we can get going we're good to go yeah, we can yeah. i'll so, let you take it away my, my, uh, dr Endon. go ahead <laughs> so we just want to welcome everybody we're super excited about this everybody loves puppies and we certainly love puppies we're both dog obsessed and so definitely our favorite topic um, and puppies, I think, are especially um, fun because they're so wonderful and so horrible at the same time. So I know everybody who gets a puppy is like, what did I do? And I think that's natural. And um, e even those of us who have a lot of experience, um, we go through the same thing and it's a lot. And so we want to kind of just take you through some of the basics and talk about from a medical standpoint, what I um, recommend just in terms of keeping your puppies healthy. You're going to go to a lot of vet visits initially. And so just kind of giving you a sense of what you can expect, but um, also that really crucial part of making sure that you're setting up your puppy behaviorally so that your relationship can continue to be just really strong and that you have, you know, you develop this long lasting, healthy relationship with your dog. That's what we want. 100% got to just echo that and love, always love the kind of um, com combination of medical care and mental health care and like the co as we come together that's where we can really like give you the best and most holistic advice so super excited as always to be working with you Dr. Rendon. Um, <clears throat> let's do our intros. I'm just gonna turn off my heater one second. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's getting warm um well I guess I should start with myself I'm 
my name is Karishma War. I am a dog trainer and behavior consultant, and I work right now as head of training and behavior at Calm Canine Academy. So we're just a group of dog trainers who consult virtually to clients around the world. So this is our specialty. It's about teaching you guys what you need to know to be the best guardians. Um, and we're always, like I said before, very uh, excited and uh on it to to uh, kind of team up with amazing medical professionals like Dr. Rendon. I'll let you introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm Gina Rendon, and I am a vet at Williamsburg Veterinary Clinic in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I've been practicing for about 20 years. And so um, as a general practitioner, I, I love my job. Uh, and uh, yeah, and that's it. So it, uh, hopefully, um, I know that there's Sally is here, there might be other people in this area, but um, this is something that we hope that everybody gets something out of. Yeah, I'm super excited to make this as a resource as well for people to be watching. So maybe we've linked you to this at some point. And hello, <laughs> if, that's, if that's you. Uh, if you just uh, quickly, just for the for the joke, I had to just get up because my dog stepped on the TV remote and turned on the TV for the second time today. Um, so that's why I just popped off camera for a second. Had to go deal with that. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's uh, let's do our little, little overview and then we'll let, we'll get started. <laughs> So we're going to cover a lot of things, and um, we're not quite sure how long all of this is going to take. There are more resources that you're going to be able to um, access after this, and so um, you know, hopefully, we'll we might even have time for a question and answer at the end. We'll see. But so um, we're going to go through the developmental stages of the puppy. Uh, we're going to talk about the first vet visit and vaccines. We're going to talk about that really, really important topic of socializing um, while they're still going through the vaccine series. That's such a big one. And then touching on some of the topics that we get questions about all the time, like the teething and the mouthing, what you should be feeding, crating, house training, and you know the, the brief talk, topic of uh, spay and neutering. And then we have other, other little tidbits that we'll go through. So um, this is our overview, but we're going to start off with our developmental stages. Um, so this is, to me, really incredibly interesting. So week one, we're in our neonatal period. And so all puppies, the interesting thing about little puppies is that they all look the same, whether they're German shepherds or chihuahuas or whatever. They all come out as these little kind of amorphous little lima beans, these little fuzzy lima beans. And they're blind and they're deaf and they can barely walk. They can wiggle a little bit. So they wiggle towards their mother. They wiggle towards warmth. But they're basically just helpless little fuzzy lima beans week one. Um, week two, they are in a little transitional period where they're developing a little bit more movement. Um, and that's when their eyes start to open. So that's when they're really starting to take in a little bit of the world. Um, and all puppies were, are born with blue eyes. Probably, I don't, I don't know if everybody knows that, but so sometimes they'll, they'll come to you with blue eyes and then those eye, the eye color may change. But um, it's always interesting when you see those little babies, you're like, oh, look at those blue eyes. And then they don't stay that way. So uh, week three, oops, um, week three is the start of, I'm not in control of the um, <laughs> the weeks. So uh, there we go. Week three <laughs> is, <it's okay. laughs> is the start of the critical period for socialization. And so a lot of people don't know that this actually starts this early, but it does. And so we're going to talk in more detail about what it means, this critical period, um, but this is, again, this is a period where their brain is starting to take things in, they're starting to see things, um, and, and we're going to touch on that in a little bit more detail. Week four um, is when they're starting to become a lot more, <laughs> a lot more mobile. So they're moving around a lot. Um, they, they may actually be able to start taking steps and walking around. Um, so that that activity increases, and then we can go to week five. Week five is when they become really mouthy. This is when actually their little baby teeth are starting to, to come in, those little sharp little daggers. Um, they can hear now, so their ear canals, which were closed, are now opening up, which I find really fascinating. But what's really important is that um, this is when they're starting to really explore the world with their mouths. So they're, they're mouth creatures for life. And this is really important to appreciate and to understand. And, and it also makes sense why mom will start weaning at this point, because those little dagger teeth are actually going into her poor little uh, her poor mammary glands. And so she's going to be less enthusiastic about having those puppies latch on. Um, week six is um, when they, oh, this is, yeah, when they start to develop object permanence, which means 
If you hide something, they remember that it's there. Um, babies develop this, human babies develop this between eight and nine months old. So I find that really interesting if you do a little hiding game with, with them at this age. Um, many of them will remember that it's hidden. So that I think is very interesting. And then their personalities will start to differentiate. And so if you've ever had, if you've ever been lucky enough to um, watch puppies grow from birth, then you'll see those, the shy one is the shy one and the really bold one is really bold. Their personalities really come out. And it's really interesting because they've all had the same um, you know, environment. They've had the same experiences for the most part, but personality-wise, they may be different. And I also find that really interesting. Um, week seven is uh, another social learning phase for them. So right now, they're they're much more active. They're running around. They're interacting with each other, and so their experiences with each other um, are, start to sink in. Like if they bite another one of their siblings too hard, and they get corrected for that, or they get you know, basically yelled at by their siblings, then they're, they're learning those things. They're learning not to bother mom. So she's also correcting them. So that's a big part of their social learning. And then week eight um, is another secondary socialization period. So the, the socialization period actually has um, ups and downs. And so at this point, um, it, it, they're still really open to learning everything. They're still, um, they're, they're wired to accept new things, everything is new to them. And so what they're exposed to at this point is what they're gonna be used to you know, as they continue to develop. But at this point in the game, they start to become a little bit more fearful and they become a little bit more um, resistant to meeting new strangers. And so you know, the kind of the crazy thing about this is, this is when they get adopted. And so eight, week eight is when they're usually sent home. So between eight and 12 weeks is, you know, mom is done with them. <laughs> She's moved on. She's ready to get out of there. Um, and they are, uh, you know, developed enough that they can be sent home. And so the amazing thing to me, next slide, is that by eight weeks, puppies are basically the developmental equivalent of a one-year-old baby. Isn't that, it's kind of amazing to me. And so look at that pictures. Um, and so they're coming to you at this stage between eight and 12 weeks, having had all these experiences, which is really amazing. And, and if you think about it, you know, the developmental, that, that critical stage is between um, three and 16 weeks, half of it has already gone by. And so they're coming to you with a lot of experience. So this is one of the reasons, reasons why I think like the puppy mill um, situation is such a travesty because those puppies are not having any kind of socialization. I saw that you posted about the um, the ban on puppy mills in New York City. We're so excited about that. So that's really awesome. Um, and so this is the time they're going to your home. And basically, you're going to bring your puppy home. And this is the point where you're going to actually come bring your puppy to me. So we're going to start talking about the first vet visit. <clears throat> um, and the vet, the first vet visit is you just want to make sure your puppy is OK. And you want to start getting on board with all the vaccines, with everything else. Um, the physical exam is going to take place. And so this is basically the vet just taking a look at your puppy and making sure everything is good. We're going to look at the mouth and make sure that they have all of their teeth. We're looking in the ears to make sure there is no ear infection, listening to the heart for any kind of heart murmurs, anything like that. Um, sometimes they'll come with a little umbilical hernia, which is something that you would want to uh, take uh, uh, address at some point if it's uh, a problem. We're checking to make sure that like, the males have both of their testes descended. So sometimes they won't. Um, and that's another thing that you have to, to address. Um, <laughs> I see you. <laughs> um, go ahead. And so we're also going to uh, do a parasite check. We're looking for fleas, um, any little lice. And, and these things actually are the, the parasites, the vaccines. It really depends. On, since this seems to be an international audience, it depends on where you're coming from. What, what are the things that you're going to find? Fleas are pretty ubiquitous across the world. Um, various mites. There are various things that uh, that uh, different regions will have. Um, also, bring in a poop sample. So that's our. Go ahead and <laughs> I feel like I should have a, a signal for you. <laughs> so um, we're checking for those external parasites. Next, thank you. And then, <laughs> and then, always remember to bring in a poop sample. We want, really want to make sure that there's no intestinal parasites, which they do get from mom. It's not a reflection of 
you know, the breeder or their background, they almost all have parasites. Um, sometimes they can be hard to find. So usually in puppyhood, we're doing two fecals. Uh, intestinal parasites are things that you can get from them. Those can be zoonotic diseases. And so this is also protecting you. Um, often puppies come in with those big bellies and that can be a sign of intestinal parasites, but it's not, you, you, wanted to do, you want to do a fecal to be sure. Um, next. Uh, preventatives. And so this is also regional um, in the United States and actually in most of the world, uh, heartworm disease is a disease, which is uh, worms that literally go to the heart and lungs transmitted by mosquitoes. And most places will have a preventative that they start the puppy on now. It's monthly for life. And so you'll get those preventatives. And then generally for the ectoparasites for fleas, ticks, um, lice, mites, there are the um, preventatives, the flea and tick preventatives. You can go ahead and do the two next to heartworm, um, fleas and ticks, and then vaccines. Um, vaccines definitely depend on where you are. So geographic location, um, and it depends on lifestyle. So uh, what you're gonna do with your dog, if they're gonna go for boarding, if they're gonna go for walks and, um, and they're usually started, sometimes they're started by the breeders, it's between six and eight weeks old that they begin, and then they're going to get vaccines every two to four weeks until they're 16 weeks of age or older. Mm -hmm. So next slide, um, I'm just going to quickly talk about the vaccines, and these are recommendations by the World Small Animal Veterinary Association and by AHA, the American Animal Hospital Association. So there are experts that come together to make guidelines for vaccines. Um, this top that this top one, distemper, parvo adenovirus, which is also known as canine in infectious hepatitis. This is the only vaccine that's considered core worldwide. Um, you can go ahead and hit go, because um, I think I have these little points in here. <laughs> so these, these diseases are, um, they can be fatal, not always, but they can be fatal. And so um, they're given as a combination shot, often with parainfluenza, uh, and they're started between six and eight weeks and given every two to four weeks until they're 16 weeks old. This is the most important vaccine. And so this is the one that's basically limiting your ability to get your dog out and socializing with every dog on the street. And you have to be careful about, um, you know, what, where they're going. But uh, so this is the one that you have to wait for this entire series before you're really just having your, your puppy out there. Um, other vaccines, rabies is, it's always funny to me, most places have rabies, but the UK does not because you're an island nation. So um, there are some places that are actually rabies free. I know, so lucky. But if you're in London, I bet a lot of people travel and so they'll need rabies to get to Europe or to get to other, other places. So sometimes they'll probably do that. Um, and then other vaccines, there's something called leptospirosis, which is also, oh, that's given between 12 and 16 weeks, and that's done um, a year later and then every three years. Leptospirosis is a bacteria carried by wildlife and rats. And so in an urban setting like London or, or Manhattan, Brooklyn, um, definitely something that I would consider a core, and that started anywhere between eight weeks and older, that's two doses. And then there are what we call the lifestyle vaccines, which are para-influenza, that's usually in that combo vaccine. Um, there's Bordetella, canine influenza, the Lyme vaccine. There's all kinds of other vaccines. And again, it depends on where you are. I started looking up some of the ones in other parts of the world, and then I stopped because it was too much. <laughs> so anyway, those are the vaccines, and you'll discuss all of that with your vet. Um, and so we want to get back to this critical period for socializing, which is between three and 16 weeks of age. And so um, Go ahead and hit the slide. So just the definition, go ahead, there we go. The maturational stage, This it's defined as the maturational stage um, in the lifespan of an organism, and in this case, our puppy, during which the nervous system is especially sensitive to certain environmental stimuli. And that means this is when they're the most open to things. We've already talked about that a little bit. And so again, we're looking at this period of three to 16 weeks when this is when they're most open to learning about the world. Um, but what we've said, the conundrum is that they're not going to be fully protected from diseases until they're fully vaccinated, which could be 16 weeks or older. So this is the conundrum. This is the thing I think that people find really challenging. 
um, because we want to be able to give our our dogs the most exposure, but obviously we don't want them to be unsafe. And so um, the but having said that, I think one of the things that's so important to know is that um, that if you don't set them up for success in terms of socializing, you will have problems. I have literally known people who, um, won't let their dogs touch the ground until they're fully vaccinated. And I'm not even kidding about this. Those dogs become a disaster later in life. They're so nervous. They're so scared. Unfortunately, I remember a puppy that had parvovirus that we had to quarantine for two weeks and him not being socialized for those two weeks. It, again, it was such a disaster for that poor dog's mental health. And so what we want to do is be able to make sure that your puppy is getting the correct vaccines becoming protected, but then also um, knowing what you need to do to socialize. I want to just double down on that, especially as well. Like I'm, I'm totally there as an anxious dog mom wanting to make sure that my dog's not, my puppy's not getting sick, but it, the medical dangers are not the only dangers, right? That's what you're saying. The kind of mental health mm -hmm. um, side of things is just as is important and I have can yeah countless examples very similar to yours um <clears throat> with dogs who got unwell and needed to be quarantined or were puppy mill dogs so didn't leave a cage for those you know 12 weeks um and they always end up with working very closely with both of us in right. <laughs> um, for various reasons. Uh, and that's why we're here today, right? Because if we can get in with this information at the beginning, we can avoid um, all of that. And I think to just uh, kind of um, underline again, what you were what you're saying, I added in this resource, which I find really useful. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of nice to have it as well, because the association that this that made this document the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior are folks who have medical um, degrees and as well as behavior degrees so they're like the combination of us into some sort of super practitioner <laughs> 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 Um, and they they have this really great position statement. So I've linked it here. So when we send this out, you can read it in full. But it essentially says what 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 Dr. Rendon's saying, which is we need to expose them in a way that is safe, in a way that is as safe as possible. So some examples that we have that we use um, as dog trainers is um, using. Uh, uh, like high quality uh, cleaning products that are designed for dogs to clean the space and then host puppy playtimes with dogs that all have the, va the, uh, the need the necessary vaccinations in like a, a safe environment that for example is a safe socialization setting compared to Manhattan dog run um, right. with all the rat feces and sick you know all the animals that go through that that kind of environment so um yeah, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to jump to the next one because we have a little bit more information about socialization here. Um, I'm going to maybe let you talk a little bit about the vaccination piece here and who right. they shouldn't be interacting with Dr. Ending because yeah. that's yeah. Your, your, your area. Yeah, so so puppies that are going to puppy socialization classes, they tend to be vaccinated along at, at about the same age, the same level. And um, and so puppy socialization classes, I think, are such a great idea. It was really hard during the pandemic because puppies don't zoom very well, but, um, you know, making sure that you find groups where the people are, uh, responsible or that, you know, that the people who are supervising are making sure that the dogs, uh, the puppies are on their vaccine schedule. So definitely they can play with puppies. You always want to make sure too, that the puppies are healthy, that nobody's sneezing, that no dog has diarrhea. Another good reason to make sure that you're checking your stool samples regularly to make sure that they're, they don't have parasites. Um, but also to me, you know, if you have friends that have dogs that are fully vaccinated and again are healthy, you want to make sure that you're, you know, that they're not carrying anything. Um, and then the other important thing is that they're good with puppies because not all older dogs are good with puppies, then, then absolutely have them hang out. This is the time of year actually where everybody's traveling with their dogs. And so I get asked, you know, can my puppy meet my parents' dogs? If your parents' dogs are good with puppies and they're healthy and they're vaccinated, Absolutely. Take advantage of those times because you really do want your puppies to be um, exposed. You want them to meet other dogs and to have good experiences with other dogs. That's key. 100%. And I think lots of people get worried about their pups interacting with other, other dogs. I, my big thing here is 
uh, I, of course, care about the vaccination status, but just like Dr. Renan said, I care about whether or not that dog uh, is going to be an appropriate yes. person. Yes. As a socialization experience. Yeah, because what socialization actually is defined as is exposure without causing um any discomfort essentially so socialization doesn't just mean like we don't just like point the puppy in the direction of the stimulus and go okay exposure it has <laughs> to be, it has to be really positive it has to be what i say always is overwhelmingly positive because they are like sponge like at this age and what that usually means is that they are creating their conceptions of the world and i want them to learn primarily that the world is safe 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 that's my big word like safe I want it to be safe more than anything else and there are lots of different things that we need to make safe <laughs> um it's not just introducing them to other dogs and people socialization doesn't just mean like social things um it's exposure to many different things that they're going to have to handle so I have a list here um and just some cute videos that we can watch to go along with it with the with the idea that it's not just people it's moving objects it's the clattery surface of this um puppy pen that we're using to uh give this dog good experiences because this pup lived in new york so they couldn't really go walking for long periods of time out on the dirty crazy uh, like streets so we have to think about other ways um that we can be building confidence for our dogs um we have i have a few different videos to show you guys um so that you can see some examples of what we'll we'll do confidence building um, activities, exposure to different sensory um, experiences, climbing, uh, problem solving, putting your heads in flower pots and, and clambering over noisy surfaces. That's all socialization. Um, if you don't mind, I, I'm going to chime in. So there is a, the, there's Pen Vet Working Dogs Group um, that train the dogs that eventually become your search and rescue dogs or, you know, some of the dogs your um, your remains finding dogs, the cadaver dogs, the dogs that sniff out for cancer. So they're really hardcore working dogs. And a lot of these dogs are working under circumstances that most dogs would be afraid to go. If you think of like a, a search and rescue type of a situation um, where they're having to go through rubble. And so very early on, like they, they get them from birth they are doing exactly this where they have the the surfaces that are uneven they have to walk across things that are loud and scary they have to they're they're exposing them to absolutely everything they're putting them on surface that surfaces that wobble so that they're used to being uncomfortable that they're off balance um you know the, they're doing alarms they're doing vacuums they're doing all of this and making it so that it's not something that's weird to the puppy so that's kind of an idea of the things that you should be thinking about. It actually occurred to me, I wish what I had done with my puppies is jingle key, keys around them all the time because the jingling of keys and the jingling of collars are one of the things that some of my dogs have been uh, reactive to. And so that that's a good time. The knocking on the door exposed them to that. 100% absolutely. And at this age, it's often easy to make this really positive experience. We can pair it with food, we can pair it with play, and we can just make it a part of their day, right? You might not be able to go for long walks in your busy city, but you can play loads of games like this inside and don't skip this step. This is a really important step and it's so fun. Um, <laughs> and our Instagram and many other dog training Instagrams are full of examples like this. If you do puppy classes, they'll often give you kind of, you know, exercises that you can do like this. So um, don't skip these important steps. I'm going to, I think I have like uh, potentially another, uh, some more examples here. Yeah. So the, the steps that I see people missing more of, most often are the surfaces, the, and, and kind of that early, those early stages where people get bored. But like Dr. Rendon said, like, this is how you create rock solid dogs that are capable of being in lots of different environments. So don't skip on the surfaces and kind of those things. And then don't skip on handling and grooming and medical care. These are the things I skipped on with my first dog. <laughs> Literally, I'm like listing the things I didn't do. And I'm like, why didn't you do that? Because <laughs> I'm paying for it now. Um, but, you know, getting your taking the time to get your puppy comfortable in the bathroom not just putting them straight in the bathtub, getting them comfy around the bathtub in the room with you, um, 
the, these slowing it down in these early stages and taking the time, really looking at the body language, look at how wiggly and floppy that puppy is. <laughs> um, that puppy is not nervous at all. This is an overwhelmingly positive experience. I literally have clients come to me and show me their videos and I'm like, I'm like positive, not positive. That was good. That wasn't good. You know, I'm like, you know, which ones were good and which ones weren't. I used to spend like every morning in the bathtub with this silly little spaniel because I knew one day he was going to be getting very muddy and really needed to be able to be in there um, comfortably. So I really don't want people to skip on these sections. I do not have, the, we don't have the capacity to give you every single socialization exercise that you could do with your dogs. But what I do want to show you is just some examples um, of what we could be doing. So for vet care, um, and grooming, we can get dogs comfy with multiple people handling them. Um, the sort of learning the details and nuances of these sorts of exercises are things done in puppy classes, right? So we have one at Calm Canine Academy. It's fully virtual. It's a four week long course where we talk you through all of these different things. Um, and we get you sending us videos of you doing this with your dog, et cetera, so that when you can learn these skills yourself, there are lots of versions of, of educational um, sort of things like this around the world. Um, but just understanding that cooperation with humans in veterinary procedures, grooming procedures, these are taught skills that we can teach a dog to do. For, and at this age, this is the time to do it. So again, I will just say for the last time, socialization is not about social stuff in most, most of the time. It's like 80%. <laughs> surfaces noises being touched the, the booties that you want them to wear in winter etc so um take time doing the, these sorts of very boring exercises <laughs> that are very actually fun when you start realizing what it unlocks um for you and your, your dogs so i just showed you eating a, your dog the dog's eating a lot of food and i think now i think would be really a useful time for dr endon to tell us a little bit about what to feed our dogs and and food and nutrition in general it's something that i know very little about but i know is extremely important um, extremely important yes also at this for some reason i don't know if this is more of a, a brooklyn thing but it's also it seems to be very um controversial <laughs> and so there is a lot of emotion that goes into what you feed your dog there's a lot of um marketing around it and so I don't really want to go into too much detail. The World um, Small Animal Veter Veterinary Association does have specific recommendations for what you should feed and why. So the science behind what you should be feeding um, and how to read labels and things like that. My recommendation, I mean, partly the reason we wanted to talk about this is because you are doing so much um, positive reinforcement with food when you're training your puppy. And so just, you know, realizing that the, a lot of the food is going to be the food that you're feeding them every day. And so my, my recommendation is a high quality commercial brand. Not every food works for every puppy. I think that's important, not for every dog. And so it's very individual. Um, uh, but you want a, a food that's specifically formulated for growth for puppies. If you have a large breed dog, you do want to have a large breed um, puppy growth food because it actually controls their rate of growth so that orthopedic issues are not an issue. Um, and so, and they, there's both dry, there's wet. Somebody did ask about raw foods and I'm going to just say personally, and again, you know, I'm not speaking for every vet, but personally, I'm not that comfortable with raw foods. They do have bacteria. Um, and so, you know, the handling of meat products in the United States, even for humans, there are a lot of issues. So there is a lot of bacteria. There's always food recalls. There's always concerns about it. They're not handling pet food better than they're handling um, pet food, uh, human food better than they're handling pet food. So you just have to be really cautious. And the experts, the, the experts on parasitology basically say, if you're feeding a raw food diet to your puppy or your dog, you should be doing four fecal exams a year to test for intestinal parasites. And they also say you shouldn't be kissing your dog, which to me is, um, it really speaks to the possible, uh, uh, contaminants that you can get. And so that's why I, I personally am not that keen about the raw foods. Um, caloric um, requirements, it's very individual for each puppy. It depends on their activity, depends on the breed. And so that's also something that you want to talk to your vet about to make sure that you're not overfeeding, but that they're getting enough. Puppies can eat a lot. I, I rarely see fat puppies, even with the ones that are being fed. 
Um, and so, you know, fed treats as for, as training, they really burn off a lot of food. And actually one of the things that I will say is that just because they're eating, you know, you, if you have a 30 pound dog, that's eating three cups of food a day, when they're a puppy, when they're bigger, they're not going to eat that much. <laughs> so don't continue to try to get that food into them once they're fully grown, because they probably won't eat it. Right, or I feel old. personally attacked right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I made that exact mistake. Yeah. And like I said that my my dog got dad bod at a certain age. <laughs> Yeah. He's got a little bit. I, I had to. I was like, "What am I doing wrong?" And then I realized uh, it, it was also because yeah. I find often sometimes the the food brands will recommend like a little bit more, maybe for the most active version yeah. of their dog yeah. of that size. And I'm like, I'm working full time. He's not the most active poodle <laughs> I know for sure. Um, and 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 so that that also comes into it. And but I, I think yeah, absolutely doubling down on this. Like I reinforce my dogs throughout the day with the calories that are available for their age breed and activity level i i use some treats but those treats are high quality treats with good ingredients that are basically just an extension of their meals like it's just part of their caloric intake of the day um and if you are using special treats taking out some of their main meals to compensate so that we're not overfeeding um especially as they get a little bit older maybe you know into adolescence when they might not be growing as much as they do at the beginning definitely uh Im important and and any food that doesn't go into training for me i think goes straight into like puzzles or some sort of interactive feeding um option that can be as simple as just throwing the food on on the ground for the dog to find in the yard or it can be you know fun food projects that you can make and looking up like dog enrichment toys will open a world up of fun games that you can play with your dogs and, and toys you can buy them to feed them in a way that fulfills their natural scavenger in a sort of needs because they are scavengers they um, are meant to scavenge for their food they often really love it um my, so first time I brought one home my parents were like you're making him work for his food and my dog was like <laughs> let me work for my food uh, and it, it, but I think it can be a, a, a a mindset shift sometimes it's like actually they want to like it feels good to do it let them um uh, and then they won't be chewing up your furniture well speaking of I, chewing. and and i'd like to say that last picture had this had the puppies feeding out of the bowl and at some point it'd be nice if there were no bowls honestly like dogs and puppies should be fed in a way that's actually going to enhance their um, their cognitive abilities, just keep them, keep them, uh, engaged. So that, that's my last statement about the feeding. Totally, totally agree. The only time I have a bowl, I, I actually bought my dog a dog bowl, a really beautiful one. And I stopped <laughs> using, it. I actually use it as a human bowl now <laughs> because I was using it so little. I like bought him this beautiful bowl. And then I was like, why am I using this for the dog? I'm going to use this, but I never, he never even uses it. So now I sometimes eat cereal out of a really fancy dog bowl, which is really <laughs> <laughs> that's where I am in my life <laughs> oh this is a big one this, this is, is a really interesting one. one this is a really good example of like behavior and medicine just being totally intersected because people come to me for this problem as a behavior problem and I'm like, this is not a behavior problem. This is a developmentally appropriate medical situation. <laughs> like that's what we've got going on here. Um, you would agree with that statement? Absolutely, absolutely. And so um, as we had previously discussed at week five, that's when those little razor sharp teeth come in um, and they start learning to explore their world with their mouth. And like I was saying before, they're always, that's always going to be the case with them. You know, we're, we're primarily visual and we're manual. We do a lot of hand stuff and they explore their worlds through their mouths. And so it's really important to, to understand that. And, um, I read one quote where puppies are basically their assessment is, can I fit it into my mouth? And that's what they're going to be doing. They have those baby teeth. Those baby teeth will actually start falling out when they're about four months old. And so sometimes older for the, the smaller breeds, I've seen some puppies that their teeth come in later. And so that whole period will, will um, shift. But uh, that teething period where their teeth are falling out, they actually do get mouthier. So I always tell people it's going to get worse before it gets better. So be prepared. If you have favorite pair of shoes, make sure you hide those because they will find them. And I've learned that lesson too many times myself, even though I should know better, but still, 
Um, and so just making sure that you're aware of that, but still, you know, they're always going to be mouthy, not to the same extent. And usually around nine months, I feel like that really intense need to keep nipping and biting that actually does decrease at about nine months. I think I totally, totally would agree with that. I think the biggest thing that I often say to people is that they come to me worried about the puppy biting. Is mm -hmm. this normal? Oh my God, my dog's biting me. It's really hard. I'm co I'm, I'm being, I'm bleeding. Uh, there's something wrong with my dog. And in 99% of cases, there is nothing wrong with that dog. In 99% of cases, we're looking at developmentally appropriate behavior, probably looking at a dog that is overtired, mm -hmm. overstimulated, maybe grumpy, maybe has a funny tummy and is just, you know, it looks really scary, but often 90% of the time, like I said, 99% of the time, it's, it's actually quite a normal and appropriate behavior. Um, <clears throat> and like Dr. Rendon said, it's not something that we can make stop. So you're going to have to hide your shoes. You're going to have to do what we call manage the situation. So when we have a baby, a human baby, we cover up the, the edges of the, of the tables and we put safety things on the plug sockets and diapers on the baby because they're going to just poop and pee everywhere. Well, that's what we're going to do for your puppy, right? So I'm picking up rugs. I'm cornering off parts of the house that have carpets. My puppy lives in a little puppy apartment, like a little pen. Um, or something like that. And we're going to talk more about that in a moment. But if your puppy is loose in the house, running around, they're going to be peeing behind the sofa. They're going to be pull, <laughs> pulling down the curtains. They're going to be doing all sorts of other things. Um, you're going to have to treat them like a human baby, right? And the same level of care and management and preemptive management of their limitation and like understanding their limitations, the same things need to happen um, with, your, with your puppy. And uh, people often say to me like oh but how will they know you know we need, they need to learn and I'm like we'd never say that about a human baby would never be like but it, the baby needs to learn to poop in the toilet how will it learn if we put a diaper on it it's just accepted that this is part of the process and it's the same with our puppies so management is going to be your responsibility um not the puppies managing their behavior and um very importantly um yeah Oh, sorry. I was kind of, yeah, I got confused. Like, <laughs> and and one thing thinking. that I would like to add to this is that, um, that it is really important to have things that they can, that are, that are, they're allowed to chew on. And so make sure that you're meeting that need. Any, any um, person who's had a dog that is working on like a raw hide or working on a bully stick, you can see, you can watch their face and see they're getting so much out of that, that chewing is really they're thinking about it. It is such a rewarding um, experience for them that it's really important that you give them things to chew. My two cents about this is that you also have to be careful about what you're getting giving them. And if you go to the toy store or the toy store, the the, the pet store, there are the the hard marrow bones. There's the antlers. Anything that's too hard, your dog can break their teeth, and they will. There are some dogs that it's a challenge, and they're going to freaking bite that thing until they break a tooth. So the rule of thumb really is if, if you can't indent it with your thumbnail, then it's mm -hmm. not appropriate. So my, my preferences for dogs for chewing are um, the knotted raw hides, the bully sticks, the things that the more they chew on it, the softer that it gets. Um, but those can actually, oh my God, pigeon. <laughs> 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 so cute. Um, but so the, those, uh, those types of things that will engage them. If you give them those things, they're much less likely to find, you know, your book that you've been reading and chew on that. So that that's important. 100% appropriate outlets for the, for the teething and mouthing is necessary. They're going to be needing lots of different things to work on. Um, and I have lots of different um, other tips as well, like giving them play with other puppies and making sure that they uh, get a chance to chew on a puppy's ear every now and again and be told hey that hurts don't do that that's an important part of learning about these things yeah. someone's asked in the chat now um how do we how what's the best way to correct a puppy for teething or mouthing um and this is something that i'm going to recommend strongly against because your puppies will grow out of this behavior with proper management um it is not something that will continue 
uh, unless it's allowed to be practiced over and over again. So the proper management is really, really important. For a more comprehensive discussion of this, I have this video for you to watch. It's like 45 minutes. I go through like every single scenario, but essentially my the biggest tip of all I, I'm going to say is if you punish your puppy for right now for, uh, for biting, you likely are just going to be massively impacting your relationship with that dog um, in a negative way. Your dog might stop biting you out of fear of being <laughs> of being reprimanded, but ultimately, the um, in many cases it doesn't work. In many cases, it actually kind of means that they bite you more and get even more frustrated. I don't know if anyone's tried to tell their puppy to stop and it hasn't worked. Um, well, it often doesn't have the the kind of end goal that we want it to have. So I would definitely avoid avoid punishing any animal for developmentally appropriate behavior because it can have serious fallout down the line but do watch this full video if you want more information about puppy nipping specifically um i think we'll talk a little bit about crating and confinement because this is a, such a valuable skill uh, for almost every puppy to have so one of the things you're going to need to do is manage your puppy right so puppy apartments, little pens, crates, one of the best ways that you can avoid getting into the situation where you're feeling the need to correct your puppy over and over again. If your puppy's running around chasing at you, jumping on you or peeing on stuff, being able to put them in a little pen or put them in a put in a um uh, and putting uh like putting things uh, putting them away in a crate or something is going to be easier for you. It's also gonna be important for vet visits, potential emergencies, evacuations, uh, travel. It's very safe to have your pup in a crash tested um, crate in the car. So getting them comfortable crated, even if it's not something you really need for the your, your personal life on a day-to-day -day basis in the future, it's very important. Um, also much easier to like potty train and stuff like that if you have a tool like that under your belt. So I definitely recommend it. Um, I think, importantly some uh expectation setting your puppy does not immediately have to be sleeping in their crate spending their whole time in their crate a minute immediately upon coming home uh what something dr rendon mentioned that's really sticking with me is that that eight week sensitive stage that they have that uh, have you reminded me of that that at eight weeks they often have a re-emergence of sort of fear behaviors and that's often when they're um going to their new homes and so frequently people want their puppies to immediately go in crates uh, overnight and they've been co-sleeping with their litter and immediately they're in a new place and it's week eight and they're being put in a crate by someone who's thinking that that's the best thing to do. I did the exact same thing. I was like, he'll get separation anxiety if I don't do this. It's actually the opposite in many cases. Um, it, it, I actually give you permission to take your time acclimating your puppy to these um, these kind of confinement systems, especially the smaller ones like the crates. Um, so take your time. I sleep with my puppies when I first get puppies. I sleep in the bed with them or on the floor with them near the crate or something like that on the sofa, spare room, something like that. Just like a baby. Um, and over time, I get them used to the puppy spaces and then slowly like a baby, put them in the pens or the crates when they're nice and sleepy, staying with them. There's a lot of parallels between sleep training, sleep training with human children and and puppies. I'm told all the time I don't have that experience myself. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, you're the expert there, but um, <laughs> I've heard there's a lot of crossover. And in fact, taking it slow, that's how you avoid separation anxiety. That's how you avoid confinement anxiety. It's a fine balance. It's like Goldilocks, right? Too hot, too cold. Don't go too fast, but don't go too slow. You want to. You want to do it, but do it slowly. <laughs> and that's why like a puppy class is so helpful because you can have some guidance, you know, when your puppy's been whining for a little bit, you can ask your trainer in that week and say, should I be letting them cry? Should I be letting, taking them out? What's, what, what's the balance to strike? I can't the, give you. The interesting thing is that they, you know, the, the, the people who are worried that they're up all night because their puppy is crying in the crate. If you put them in bed, they really don't cry. Or if you sleep with them, they really don't cry. Um, so, you know, if you don't necessarily want your puppy in your bed, which I totally understand uh, that my dogs have always slept with me personally, I find it <laughs> super cozy, but not everybody loves that. Um, but, but I think it's a really good point that it, you may have to, um, dedicate yourself to finding a place where you can sleep close by initially until they are a little bit more comfortable. It really does make a difference because they've been sleeping with their mom and their siblings this whole time. And so then to 
put them in a little area away from everybody else is a little traumatic. So um, I think, yeah. 100%. And I think that it, there's, there's this phrase that I often hear about puppies, especially around this, they'll just get used to it. Let them cry it out. They'll get used to it. Let them bark it out. They'll get used to it. And as someone who's now worked with like literally thousands of puppies, anecdotally, I can say a percentage will and a percentage won't. <laughs> and you're, you're right. It's a roll of the dice. You know, is your puppy going to get used to it? Maybe you'll be one of the lucky few who they will. But maybe you maybe they won't um and then you have the trauma to deal with and then that's a hard it's even longer take you even longer so i would probably do it slowly um and right the first time rather than having to double back um and speaking of that i've got some resources for folks um we want to make those crates fun we want to make those confinement systems fun so we have a guide here um it's on our in through our instagram we have loads of free resources so if you can you can click through and check it out and we have some like live videos where you can see training exercises or just fun tips and tricks and stuff like that so check it check that stuff out um, for more ideas uh, I think about that sort of stuff anything else you wanted to add in about uh, confinement before we moved on to pottying um well it kind of goes into the pottying I I think because um it does make it so much easier to house train and I think you know one of the things that, to me that's the biggest mistake so usually I'll see your puppy when you've first adopted and then they come back two to four weeks later for the next round of vaccines. And I always check in and I say, how is house training going? And if things have not started to, if, if your puppy has not learned how to, it hasn't been house trained at this point, something's going on. And usually the biggest mistake people make is that they're letting them roam the house unsupervised. And, and to me, that is the biggest mistake is not having that, that system where you're keeping a close eye on them. Um, and so that the the crate or the little apartment that you were talking about, that's so crucial for that, because as soon as they're able to get out of your eyesight and go around the other side of the couch, they absolutely will pee. And then you've lost an opportunity to teach them. Oh, 100 percent. And if they're not peeing, they're chewing something. <laughs> yes, exactly. And so, you know, it's a way to lose, lose in, that, in that context. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely like when I see puppies loose in the apartment it's like seeing a toddler at the grocery store yeah. by themselves yeah. I'm like yeah. where are your parents why are you here do you have money you shouldn't have money. <laughs> that's exactly how I feel it, giving the human examples is helpful because people look at a puppy and they go you should be fine you know you're you look grown up to me you're four months you're much bigger than you were at the beginning um but they're still babies they're still children and we really have to treat them like that um so management like you were saying making sure that they're not um like picking up yeah picking up rugs I got confused between my like house training management and puppy nipping but you get the idea picking up those rugs making sure that they're not having access to everything super important and then getting them in a routine honestly it's one of the biggest things I can say is a routine because once you get in that routine you're not going to be constantly worrying in the back of your head about what they're what state they're in and how full their bladders are um because with a routine you can start to preemptively take them outside. I do not like waiting for puppies to tell me that they need to go out by like barking or whining. I think that that does not set a good precedent for the adolescent years where they just see, start to push boundaries and see what they can get done. Um, I like to meet their needs preemptively rather than having them ask me to meet their needs. That's my job as the caregiver, right? So I set an alarm every half hour, every hour at the beginning. It really depends if you're potty training a eight week old chihuahua puppy, it's going to be different to a four month old Bernie's <laughs> Um, The time frames are going to look different, um, but setting up a, a schedule, preempting them needing to go and taking them out. Um, I take them out on leash and I give them steak, something really good when they go outside, something really tasty, uh, maybe something a little bit special. Uh, and I usually take them to the same place every time because do you ever like go to the bathroom and then need to pee? I, I don't know, I'm like that. If I like see a bathroom, I'm like, oh, I need to pee um, because it's a conditioned emotional response to that space. So we can do the same thing for your pup, take them to their little pee tree, <laughs> wait for them to do their pee. Then they get their cookies, then they get their walk. Um, simple. Um, and we go into some more detail in this PDF here. I talk about things like how to give a cue to the behavior, um, like, uh, you know, go potty and have them use the bathroom. So you can check that out for more details. I guess the last thing, though, is that you, you can be as good as you want. This applies to house training and and puppy biting and really all unwanted behaviors, all like, quote unquote, bad behaviors. You can be the best guardian in the world. You can have the best management. You can be on the best routine and they're still going to pee in the house. 
<laughs> they're still going to bite you. <laughs> it's going to happen, right? Um, it, it just absolutely is. So uh, try not to be beat yourself up when it happens and definitely don't get upset with them because, they're, like I said, they're just babies. So they're going to make mistakes. If your pup does have an accident in the house or if they bite you or if they do something that they shouldn't do, like destroy your $70 MacBook charger, thank you, my puppy, a few months ago, um, you take a deep breath you clean up the mess, you say, okay, what went wrong? How are we going to avoid this from happening in the future? You look at your puppy and you go, I think you're the worst puppy in the world. <laughs> you're sticky in the worst. And you move on. If you punish dogs for house soiling, especially, you end up with secret peers. Worst thing you can have. Definitely don't want a dog that's learned not to pee in front of you. Very hard to house train a dog that won't pee in front of you because you punish them for peeing. So don't punish them. Um, it likely won't teach them the lesson that you want them to learn, is, which is so often the case with punishment-based teaching methods. So I would avoid that. Don't worry, don't panic. It's not going to mean that they don't learn the lesson. They will learn, I promise. Uh, just be consistent. Um, oh, this is a good one. Spaying or neutering. So... Um, this will be something that you'll discuss with your vet, but the recommendations for spaying and neutering puppies, um, have definitely been changing. When I first started practicing, it was not unusual to spay and neuter, um, both puppies and kittens at eight weeks. So really, really young. And that was usually the rescue groups wanted you to make sure that, you know, if they sent them home with some irresponsible owner. They weren't, th those puppies weren't going to have. So it was, I think out of a sense of, um, you know, they wanted to make sure that there were not more unwanted puppies or kittens, but, um, but, you know, maybe not the best thing for them. And so then the recommendations shifted to about six months for both males and females um, for and, and dogs and cats for spaying and neutering. And now there's more research that if you wait longer that there, is, there are possible anti-cancer and orthopedic benefits to waiting. Um, so for the large breed dogs, your um, your Bernese's, your even your golden retrievers, dogs like that, um, there may be some benefit from that hormonal input. And so waiting until past a first heat cycle or waiting um, 14 months to do those uh, procedures um, might be beneficial. I think that the, there may still be information that's missing. I think sometimes you know, the pendulum swings. And so I know, um, you know, one of the things that we see with female dogs is that if they are spayed later with every heat cycle, their risk for developing mammary tumors goes up. And so that's, I think, one of the, um, one of the factors that's a little bit harder. Every time I see a dog that has a mammary tumor, it, I, I get so bummed out about it. It's so, it's such a, um, you know, it's not fun to see. And so I don't know that I would necessarily say don't spay or neuter, but um, but at this point, the recommendations are moving those ages back so that there is some hormonal input. Um, but, you know, one of the things actually that I wanted to talk to you about is I do find that for the dogs that are intact and they're older, there are some issues in terms of their behavior. And I'm not talking about aggression. I think one of the things that I see with um, with males, for one thing, let me just say, when you don't neuter the males until after a year, they are so handsome. They get these big heads. Oh my God. And those little waists, they stay nice. And oh my gosh, I, I see them and I, I can't, I love them so much. So that, you know, there's that <laughs> aesthetic benefit, but, but some, sometimes one of the things that I see, which I find really interesting is that they don't, it's harder to get them to focus on you. Um, and I, I, I'm curious about what you think about this because they are all nose to the ground. They do this thing, you know, they do the Fleming response where they're sucking, yep, exactly. <laughs> they are, and they're not even looking at you because they've got one thing on their mind and, uh, and it's so overpowering. And so when you take them outside, they are just like looking for, you know, who's that chick I'm going to meet. Um, and so I, I was wondering if you find those intact males, if you're, if you're having a hard time with management management of behaviors that's a really good question and uh yeah i, I have an intact male and an and a, uh, um an altered male in the house um and and pardon repeat, repeat that ash is um ash is over a year now a year over a year okay months. yeah he's a big boy and he's definitely doing exactly what you're talking about 
um, especially in a vet clinic. Uh, I imagine lots of female smells, lots of yeah. hundreds of female smells, um, and it can be extremely overwhelming for them, much like, you know, hunting dogs on scent or on prey. And it really this discussion, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of nuance to it because absolutely you might be competing with an environmental reinforcer like female scents um and and you might be competing with reproductive urges with intact males more so than with um males that are have been um have been neutered but um we're also i also have the considerations of in my head of when that surgery is taking place in terms of their development mm -hmm. because that eight that six to eight month period where we often get the spay neuters in can also be a very dicey time emotionally for those dogs. So that yeah. I'm always worrying, like, especially when people come to me with dogs who are having a difficult transition into adolescence and they're about to have a major surgery. I'm always like, can we just wait a little bit longer until they're just a little bit more solid and stable? Because there's a lot of experience personally yeah. from my, myself and my, my colleagues of that period after that few months after being quite challenging for the yeah. dogs and guardians. And so I'm always balancing that. And exactly that conversation I had with my trainer, another one of my colleagues the other day with her intact spaniel, where she was like, I want to keep the confidence of the balls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I because he was a bit nervous and she was like, I don't want him to go through the medical, the, the challenge, which is surgery. It's hard for any, any animal to go through surgery. And he was fearful already. She was like, but good God, he is so hard outside. It's hard to get his attention. And we had that debate. We were like, what's better? And honestly, I don't know the answer either. Yeah, I, just, I, don't yeah. I, answer. I agree. I think, um, so there is a question, how often um, do Shelties, how often do dogs go into heat? It's twice a year. Um, and so, which is kind of interesting and it's not, there, there are some dog, I think cats actually, their reproductive cycles are based on the day length and that's not true for dogs. It's untethered to, um, the seasons, but so twice a year for dogs. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say about the male dogs, I don't find this as much with the females. I think their other dogs are more interested in them, but with the intact males, uh, I often hear that. Um, they are targets of other dogs when they go out, not necessarily that they're aggressive, but other dogs are picking on them. And so it makes it really challenging because, um, yeah. Yeah, that's another one of the considerations I'll often give folks as well. So that it's like this balancing act and all I can really, we can really do, I feel like is give you like, this is the, these are the challenges you might have in either situation and yeah. in a city, an intact male especially can be a challenge because there are so many other dogs who are phobic or triggered by in other other intact males and then will, uh, you know, in a really bad situation, full on attack them, but low level, just give them the glare. You know, yeah. everywhere, yeah. whenever they're out on the street, you know, they're yeah. getting threatened from across the way. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it does, it will do something to you to be treated like that out in public. So um, it, these are definitely things to be, to be, to be thinking about for sure. And I honestly, like, I don't have the, the answer. I neutered my first dog five years ago um, at the six month mark, uh, exactly, uh, which was kind of exactly what I was told at the time. And my, our new dog, we're going to wait as long as we can and hopefully try to compete with the environmental distractions. And I'm, to be honest, we're actually doing a really good job of being able to compete with the environmental distractions with getting in early with training and engagement games around those things. Um, and then, you know, honestly, I don't take my, um, adolescent intact dogs to many places where there are unknown females intact and they're knocking around because they smart. will get good no, yeah yeah that's not me i'm not doing yeah. that um, yeah. So it, yeah. it's, it's all about weighing it up really isn't it a couple of other questions so um how long does a dog stay in heat it's variable so it can be anywhere between a month to three months so it really depends there's it's a very complicated hormonal symphony and so that that really can depend um, and then there was that cute comment about, is your head 2%, 10% too small? That's, <laughs> I know that dog, I think it's dusty. She, I, I, the same with Hera though, my dog as well. I look at him and I'm like, you're not, you're not, you're, you're not very family. family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, we got a, a few other like straggler topics that we were asked about, weren't we? Mm -hmm. Um, I have a few, I'm going to just be very quick because then maybe we could take a few questions if anyone does have any, but I can like very quickly whack out a few thoughts about these puppies and children 
My biggest thing here is supervision. To be perfectly honest, like puppies and children, puppies and older dogs, puppies and uh, puppies and anyone that's important and we have to be careful about. We need constant supervision. Um, for me, the adults need to be have there needs to be one adult whose job is to supervise that interaction to me um so someone is on kid watch puppy watch to make sure that that interaction is going well if they are not able to supervise that puppy goes in their puppy apartment another great reason to work on that confinement training right when we do want to have children and puppies interacting it's very much not hugging kissing in many cases it's not even touching it's throwing treats <laughs> for the dog to find. It's hiding the treats around the room and then watching the dog um, go and get those treats. The, and the biggest thing I can say about puppies and children is all of those videos you see online with like the, the kids and the puppies cuddling, they're lies. <laughs> don't oh my gosh. It, it, yeah, they give me chills because it's right. like, oh, don't, no, it's not a good idea. You really, yeah, yeah. Those are those are scary when you see the faces yeah. of some of those dogs, and 100%. it's and it's posted as this is cute, and you're like that is that dog is not happy. So I totally agree. Yeah, so it's definitely going to be on it with that, and and similarly with puppies and other dogs. Like if you're taking, like Dr. Renner said, like you have to check is that dog good with puppies. Um, and even dogs that are good with puppies, there's a certain argument to be made that they shouldn't have to just put up with being beaten up by puppies because lots of puppies will just be puppies. You know, they don't know. I'm sure you've experienced it with your puppies, right? They don't know what, what's polite and what's not polite. They just know what feels good. And sometimes jumping on older dogs and biting their ears feels good. So just like puppies and kids need to be managed so that the human children don't mishandle the puppies puppies and older dogs need to be watched to make sure that on both sides those interactions are super appropriate and we use our management right if, if for whatever reason things are going south or older dogs just like looking at you like help me um puppy goes in the puppy pen or the older dog goes in the puppy pen or whatever so yeah be just be mindful um mindful about both of those scenarios do you have think that makes sense any other like tips to add to the puppies or other dogs? I think um, one of the things that I actually see in your Instagram videos that I think is so good is that um, dogs and puppies are all about movement too. And so um, we're so used to meeting at a cafe or you know meeting in a little enclosed space. It is so much easier for dogs to meet each other when they're moving. And so um, that's a great way to get dogs to, to meet each other is having everybody just walking along rather than expecting that you're going to go into a, you know, a confined space and have them all come together. So that that's another thing that I think we don't utilize enough is, um, you know, kind of thinking about the way they think about the world and just making sure that we are playing into their strengths. And so that, that um, doing I that. Love, I love that one. That's such a good one. And similarly with strangers, I'll say the same thing with, for them as well. My favorite way to introduce dogs and any other social creature is through like a walk together um a walk which takes the pressure off the social interaction yeah. and as an autistic person i can say <laughs> it works great <laughs> it's really nice if it feels good for me it probably feels good for the dog because they're also very sensitive to social pressure right and so being able to move um regulate through nature maybe look at some stuff together, do an activity together in tandem, um, really, really helpful. And if you don't have the luxury of being able to go outside for whatever reason, just taking the pressure off the social interaction by having something to do each, right? Mm -hmm. The puppy has their, their their little project and you're doing your own thing. The, the goal is not to make it too overwhelming. And that's really what the movement helps do is it dissipates some of that intensity. So yeah, definitely. That's a great, great tip. I didn't even realize that I was giving that tip, but that's a great. And I, I love when people say what they've learned from my Instagram. Like, oh yeah, that is a good tip, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, we've got a, a really good question about getting puppies in the winter versus the summer. I have my <laughs> personal opinions on this. Um, do you have any opinions on this? Do you have a preference for yourself? Um, personally, I would prefer to get them in the summer too, because winters are really hard. So that's my preference. Um, yeah. But I've, you know, I've made the mistake of getting them in the winter. <laughs> I've done it in the winter as well. And I've, that's why I say some of the summer puppies, for me, it also, I guess, depends on what your summers and winters look like. Right. If you have like disgustingly hot summers, which make it impossible to get right. outside, that also might not be, might be ideal. 
Um, and if you have a husky, your your crisp winter might actually be a really nice time to have. Yeah. It does depend. But for me, I in UK, New York, kind of the places that I've lived, um, muddy puppy feet, wiggly, bitey puppies, wet puppy bellies, trying to wipe everything. <laughs> You're living through it right now. I'm sure it's the 17th of December for anyone who's watching the recording. So everyone in the audience is like, shut up, crush I don't want to hear it. I know it. I live it every day. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it's it's harder standing outside waiting for them to pee in the cold. Um, yeah, but then in the summer you have the difficulties of absolutely crammed parks and urban centers. So it's really always a toss up. It's like, would I rather be with my fearful puppy in the rain in the park on my own, or would I rather be in the summer when there are barbecues everywhere? It, I don't know. I don't have the yeah, answer. I, um, actually, <laughs> uh, what do you think about wee wee pads? What's your opinion on? Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, this is a good question. If you have a giant dog, I probably would not right. personally go for something like a wee wee pad. Um, if you have a small dog and you live on the 70th floor in Manhattan, different story. If you have a Pomeranian in a high rise or you have, you know, a husky in a detached house, very different situations. The challenges of pee pads are that you are teaching your dog that a white square means potty potentially problematic when you go into your friend's bathroom and they have a nice clean white bar, uh, bath mat down on the floor and your puppy pop, puppy pop, like just drops a squat and of course you train them to do that that's what a pee pad is um so that there is that there is some issues around potentially dogs eating poop if it's left out on puppy pads for too long um these are things that we might be worrying about um but then, you know, if you have um, a disabled handler and a small dog, it can be a really amazing situation. I've trained my mum's Shih Tzu, who's like this big, to go on his little pee pad and he'll go, he'll do his potty and he'll come back and he'll get his cookie and it's great for her. But there are there are some risks um, to something like that, which are obvious, as well as the fact that the last thing, I guess, the last risk is that they're not learning to hold their pee as mm -hmm. well. Right. So if they've got puppy pads down all the time, they're just going every two seconds. So there will be some elements you have to add in. <laughs> you have to teach them to hold their urine. You have to differentiate between the pee pads and the bath mats and figure that out along the way. But so it, it looks it's like a simple solution to a complex problem, but it actually can make it more complicated down the line. So just bear that in mind. Um, I think your your advice of just making sure that you're doing things on a schedule makes a lot of sense. And especially in this area where people do live in high rises. And so they've got a puppy that they've got to take 18 floors down and take them outside. Um, just making sure that you're doing it regularly. Um, as far as the development goes, uh, puppies, the rule of thumb is they can't hold their pee for um, for incredibly long. So it's their, the number of months they are in age. So an eight week old puppy plus one, an eight week old puppy should be able to hold their bladder for three hours. And so keeping that in mind, that's something that improves as they get older, obviously. And so once they're fully adult, they should be able to hold their pee for anywhere between eight and 12 hours. Not that I recommend having them hold it for 12 hours, um, but uh, it definitely improves as they get older that they're able to, whereas when they're puppies, they're not able to. So it's really, if you're taking your puppy out twice a day, that's not enough. So just, just really remembering that. Absolutely not enough. A hundred percent agreed. And, and actually Sally's got a good question here. Can you mix pee pads and walks or should they really be doing one or the other and that could be a nice I think mixing can be something that can be done and it, honestly that's that's the only thing I'd do I would probably rarely only pee pad train a dog I would probably always do both um and then if you do a mixture of both you can also add in some time where they're holding their pee and the pee pads aren't accessible so that they learn that sometimes they have to hold it but they can use the pee pad if they if you if they need to that's often the best I actually taught my poodle to pee in the bathtub Mm -hmm. um uh, that's what he does he'll jump in the bathtub and, and and do a little piddle and then I just can like swill it away um but I didn't want him peeing on a pee pad because he has more more pee he's too big he has more pee than a pee pad yeah. well yeah. <laughs> <You're> just, yeah. <laughs> just spilling everywhere um the last thing that we have on here is grooming which just I guess think back to that section on socialization because the biggest part of being a puppy parent is exposing your dog to the grooming needs that they'll have and every dog's different you know my poodle uh, is the bane of my life and requires about an hour of brushing every day and clippers and scissors and also like four different brushes and 
a forced air dryer and all sorts of things. Um, but there are some dogs who have relatively low maintenance and care needs. It really depends on the dog. Um, mm. I cannot under underestimate the importance of grooming and hygiene and the, the care of keeping their nails well kept and their ears clean. This is something, again, this is just like a list of all the mistakes I made because I made this mistake with my poodle in, in, in early life. I didn't keep him well um, and it affected his behavior. He was uncomfortable. He had itchy skin. It affected the way he moved when his nails weren't kept well. Uh, and it, it's it's not good for them so really prioritize it prioritize the brushing and getting them in getting them in good shape and it's learn to enjoy it because it's going to be something you do a lot with them over the course of their life um, and teach them to enjoy it as well and you'll have a much happier household as a result I think um yes um oh god Maya yes I feel bad for the guardians of dogs who are told that their non-shedding dogs require uh, do not require lots of grooming it is a scam. He also sheds just low key. He's a poodle, but he sheds a lot. And I just have to in, have to manually remove the hair. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very poorly designed animal, but I love him and he's perfect. Um, <laughs> we have um, we have a very dramatic and, and a very cute final thoughts slide. Um, I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts, Dr. Endon, anything? Big. My my final thoughts. Um, I really love this picture because they're both a little scruffy and they're a little um, they're just adorable. So uh, you know, there's you're going through a lot with your puppies. I know, um, and what I really hope that you get from you know the the socialization, the training that you're doing, is that you're you're starting to focus on them as individuals. You know, this is the thing to me that's so fun and so interesting, is. Um, watching what they do as much as they watch you. They watch you. The, the funny thing to me, the amazing thing to me is how much I have not taught my dogs and how much they know. So I, there are so many things that I have not specifically focused on with my, my little, with little Jolene. All I have to say is we're done and she'll go and sit down. And I never specifically taught her that. I just, you know, that's just my way of like, I can't anymore. And she knows now um, and so they will, they're paying really close attention to everything we do, everything we say. It's kind of amazing the communication that will develop. And so I, you know, always urge people to make sure that you're paying attention to what they're telling you to, because they will. And if you, if you watch, you will see what they're saying to you. And to me, that's what's so fun and so amazing about it. So be kind, be patient. It's not always going to be hard. Um, and, and it's going to be one of probably the most rewarding relationships that you have. So that's, that's my final thought. I love that. And I was just thinking when you were saying that, like the things that you he knows, they know that you didn't teach them. It's just, as we're coming to the end of this webinar, as I start to close up, I bet you, my dog will turn up behind me going, <laughs> are you almost finished? It's time. I hear that you're doing the things when you say goodbye and you're doing the thing, you, the tone has changed. So it's so, so cool um, that how much they learn about you and then teach you about yourself and then the same in the other direction. And I guess my big final thoughts are it's absolutely going to be the most one of the most rewarding relationships. But it's also OK if in the first few months or even first year, it doesn't feel that good. I think that's something that I was not prepared for, mm -hmm. um, for it to not feel as that good. Uh, my first dog felt great. Um, and then I got my second dog and I had the puppy blues, uh, <laughs> the notorious puppy blues where you're just a bit like, I love you so much and I don't regret this, but you are hard. This is hard, <laughs> this is hard work. Uh, and this is maybe yeah. not, this, this is harder than I expected yeah. um, or different to how I expected. And um, I think we're always like, they're so cute. It's amazing. But it's also like, you're the worst. Yeah, <laughs> and absolutely. that's okay. And that's absolutely. absolutely fine. Like, just like, be totally honest about it. I like when I was raising my staffy puppy, I would like be videoing him taking a poop on my couch, just being like, look, he's pooping <laughs> on my, it's happening. Look, that he's still pooping on my couch. It's still happening. I'm just going to, I'm going to have to clean that poop up. Yes, yes. I am. Yes. Like the reality of it. And I'm a dog I'm, ownership is not for the faint of heart. It really is. Dogs are, they're, my daughter and I, we always joke about how awful they are. They eat garbage, they roll in poop, they roll in dead creatures, you know, they do all of these things, but, you know, I love them. And if, and so you kind of have to just look beyond the pooping on the couch and, you know, all the things that they do that are disgusting. And, you know, if you pay attention to their personalities and they really come out. So 
yes. <laughs> um, well, it looks like we're about finishing up. There are maybe a few straggler questions, but what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna immediately put the slides in mm -hmm. the chat because I know someone asked for um, a version. Um, so you can you can immediately look at all the links and all the videos that I've been talking about. So I'll pop that there now. Um, and I'll quickly answer that question about when you should start brushing your teeth um, as part of your socializing and getting them used to handling. So um, look through those videos that are linked. Uh, you can start brushing their teeth right away, just getting them used to you handling their mouths. I always, always, always recommend going really slow. Don't jump on them and and think that you're going to do a full toothbrushing right away. You want to just gradually um, introduce the toothpaste, introduce the toothbrush, your finger toothbrush, whatever it is. So um, you can start brushing them their teeth immediately, even though they're their puppy teeth. And then uh, uh, and then eventually when they have their adult teeth, hopefully they'll be ready to go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I have I have a few um very cute videos of me introducing the toothbrush to my uh my muscly dog and he's just like hang, hang, hang. <laughs> yeah. what is this? Uh, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> weird thing in my mouth. Um but yeah, it's been so nice um chatting to everybody and thank you so much for all your amazing thank you questions. So much. And Dr. Endon, thank you so much for coming up with the idea for the, this talk and spearheading this. It was so, so fun. And I think so hopefully it will be a useful resource for folks when they get their new puppies. You can just have a little look through. Oh my goodness, I see a little scruffy puppy. Hello, <laughs> get the baby. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and look, the Sheltie as well. Our favorite thing. I know, the serious Sheltie. Nice to see Nice to see you. Adorable. Very, very cute. I would show you my dog, but he's a black poodle in the shadows and you'll never see him. So he's just <laughs> creeping over there. <laughs> she leans in her nap. She's this is her nap time. <laughs> well, we'll be sending out the recording and slides, etc., around, and I'll send you some links if anyone's interested in learning more and seeing more free resources because we have tons. Um, and again, thank you so much. Sign up for their puppy classes. So awesome. Yeah, come and join us. It's so Do fun. It. So um, we really we really do have a good time i'll send you all links you get a discount code or something because you've all been lovely um and uh we'll be in touch tomorrow but thank you again dr Endon, and you. everyone for being here and uh we'll hopefully see you soon bye take care bye